Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 345 with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Good to hear. How am I? Nah, been better. Been better, I can tell you that much. But, you know, just hanging on in there as we all are. I'm sure you're all probably, what, getting ready for the weekend, ready to go on the lash, ready to get a bit crazy. What? I don't know. I wonder if normal people are still doing that, actually. I'm not normal people. I wonder if the average, ev- everyday folk out there is deciding to, uh, um, with, with, with deciding to withstain, yeah, withstain from the old alcoholic beverages, the old party time fun stuff, and leaving it for the weekend. Is that what people are doing? Or are you just getting crazy on a week? Because, you know, what's the point, really? That's been one of the major, that's going to be another bit of PTSD or a habit you're going to have to unlearn once everything gets back to normal. You're going to have to get back to, you know, leaving the going out and the good times for the Thursday onwards. But now you've probably had a few Monday sessions, a few Tuesday ones, Wednesday ones. So you're going to have to unlearn that. It's going to be very difficult to do. Imagine everyone's that's so used to just popping out and getting a beer for lunch or something or going wherever spoons at eight in the morning because they just want to get away from the wife. Like imagine what it's going to be like when everything goes back to normal, when this starts to become a, or maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't become a, maybe it doesn't go back to being a social faux pas. Maybe we evolve. That's our last bit of evolution as a species or a society in this country where we suddenly start to be like, you know what? It's not weird that this guy on, at the bus stop on the way to work has a K side in his back pocket. It's not weird at all. No, he he might he doesn't look homeless. He doesn't look like he's in trouble. He looks like he's got a, an Oyster card full of money, right? He looks okay. He looks like he's got his, his his life in order. You know, he might have a lot of gunk underneath his fingernails, and he might look like he hasn't taken a shower in seven days. But he should be fine. That maybe we'll get there. You never know. But um, weird, isn't it? You see that I see that often, especially when I go running. Like I'm, I'm not seeing as many people in bars and pubs which are open. I'm, but I am seeing a lot more people hanging around and just walking around. You know, clearly tipsy, clearly a bit waved, clearly that with that you know, couple of drink buzz on. Which is as a society, you're a bit like, God damn it, me! I should move across here. You're a little bit like, come on, man! You don't want, you know what I mean? You don't want your um your fellow citizen to go down like that. I wouldn't want that personally, you know. We are pretty, we're pretty tight around here. <laughs> but where I live, everyone sort of has their their shit in order, apart from the people that shouldn't have their shit in order. So to see, just you know, your neighbour going through it on the streets is a bit hard to take. But I'm sure there's probably far more scarier stories than somebody having a couple, one too many um, Marks and Spencers, you know tinned cocktails i'm sure that's not the biggest worry out there at the moment anyway if it's your first time listening to a show and you're like wow this is amazing and it's great then thank you very much i appreciate your support and if you would like to um smash that like button hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below once you're done with it and once you think i've given you a better value and if you're listening via the podcast app of course leave me a five-star review and share that show with your friends and if you want to extend the support and you want to continue to see me do more good work or you want to get early access two episodes such as the one i'm recording now which i have available uh beforehand for patreon supporters then definitely make sure you support my patreon the minimum tier i think is one dollar at the moment so i put it as low as i can get just chuck whatever you can over there um or what you call it um all donations are greatly appreciated in these dark dark times so head over to patreon.com forward slash agostino that's patreon.com forward slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o and you can send your donations over there and i'll make sure to put up all the bonus episodes and any sort of uh, episodes no most of the episodes will go or all the episodes will go up on patreon first they'll be available for a couple of days before they're out for the general public so if you want to see them ahead of time you can see them there and of course i'll make sure to record some bonus footage too along the way a couple of live stream sessions why not and maybe some uh, more random topic sessions or something a bit more focused which i'm kind of figuring out what to do but for the meantime if you want early access to the shows early access right hot fresh potato make sure you check that out on the patreon that is agostino zinga no or agostino name patreon.com for just agostino you find a link in the show notes anyway you'll find it in the description i'll put it in there bloody hell me and urls eh me and urls anyway action-packed show to you today loads of stuff to talk about from 
Uber's acquisition of Postmates to Twitter, figuring out if they're going to do a paid subscription model to the mask thing that's happening here in the UK to other bits and pieces I've seen on the internet. So much stuff to get through. I can't wait for us to kind of go through them together. So grab a hold of a drink if you've got one. I have. I'm drinking a little kombucha, com- kombucha or not kombucha, with a bit of lemon inside here. Refreshing, so please excuse me if I burp a few times. Um, grab a drink and yeah, let's go through some stuff, man. Let's see what the interwebs has told us. Well, let's see what the instant interwebs has given us on this fair day. So, first to get through, of course, is the mask in the UK. Um, it's now mandated from Friday onwards that you must wear a mask, I think, in most shops. Um, or in any enclosed area apart from somewhere where you're going where you have to eat and drink indoors which is sensible Um, from all the research we've seen so far COVID seems to spread pretty quickly and easily within confined spaces where there's not a lot of um, well I guess there's not a lot of um, air or traveling in and around you know there was a case of a dining hall somewhere in South Korea where essentially everybody that was eat one person was infected and he basically was able to pass he or she able to pass it on to the entirety of the dining room apart from maybe three or four there's been episodes of it happening on airplanes but I heard airplanes is one of the safest places to be because of how they recycle the air but basically any enclosed area you're, you're going to be in trouble so in an attempt to sort of get the virus under some kind of control in the UK especially with the amount of shops that are closing and I mentioned the other shoot the other the other day pret are closing stores you know boots are looking at closing stores so not only are the in- small independents the small mom and pop stores um shutting their stores and you know um closing their doors for the very last time we're also seeing some of the big chains um being greatly affected by it, especially the ones that have you know they, that play that game where they play high rent for a store somewhere on Oxford Street, but they also have to make sure they have a high amount of foot traffic in order to, or footfall, in order to make sure to kind of offset the amount of money they're paying for rent. So it's a really dicey game. Um, everyone needs customers, basically. Um, commerce is still king. Brick and mortar stores still, you know, form the bedrock of our economy, even though they try and tell us everything's happening from the internet. And even the internet is suffering too, because people are, you know, morale isn't well. I don't know. I'd imagine, I don't know. I'd love to know though. You know, those kind of girls that always order stuff off ASOS, um, to the office you know the kind of person that's always browsing the sales of Zara and H&M I wonder if that girl is still buying in the same amount I don't think they are I think your morale is going to be a bit down right especially if you've been at home and you're a girl and you've been comfy eating you've probably gained a couple of LBs you probably don't fit into the stuff you were wearing previously anyway so you don't even know what size you are the last thing a girl wants is to order something that she thinks she's a size in then get it and it's too small you know that'll send you down some mad spiral so I'd imagine most people aren't really spending maybe some boys are spending and buying trainers because they just want to and I don't know getting haircuts every day but I'd imagine um, consumer spending is probably down too so the 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 mandating of the mask as as much as i'd love it to be for our health and for our safety i think it's mostly a business thing um they're trying to protect their interests they've obviously got some ties to some of the industries some of the big wigs involved in these big branches you know i don't know the top shops the h&ms the uniqlo's the john lewis's they've got people up and above that need that have that foot flow in the stores need to have people in there so the least they can do is kind of lean on the government in order to get people to wear masks but I don't. The, there's like a prospective fine they've put out there about it, right? If you if you if you do wear a mask, you can. If you don't wear one in a shop somewhere, you can get fined. Be anywhere between fifty or hundred. I've seen, but we've got an article here that's going to give us some more detail on the issue, and I'll give my thoughts regarding it on the other side. So this is from the BBC. It says coronavirus. The day the England shoppers put on their face coverings. I like how they call it face coverings or not a mask. I guess because not everyone has a mask, right? Probably it's just a um, semantics thing, but. This is from uh, BBC it says, oh, better put on your mask. Uh, better put on our mask, a woman says uh, to our friend outside a homeware shop in Campbell, South London. Fishing around in her bag, she shrugs and follows her inside, opting to go without. It's the first day the face coverings have been compulsory for customers in England shops, and most people are complying on the high street. But the exchange sums up the dilemma for some shopkeepers. Exactly, because... You're, you've already got, you know, your foot traffic's already been diminished, you know, greatly by this virus. The last thing you want to do is turn away customers. But then those customers might turn away the customers if you've got indoors and have a mask on. So it's probably, it's probably within your interest if you're a shop owner, 
you know, if you haven't prepared, well, preparing for this was a bit, you know, you, you, you weren't to know to prepare for it. So that's a bit unfair. But I think by now, most shopkeepers should have ordered just a whole bunch of surgical masks, right? The kind of throwaway ones that he can get for a pound or maybe sometimes cheaper. Order a bunch of those from Amazon and just basically give them out for free to customers. That's the most you can do or you should be doing anyway going forward just so you don't make sure you don't lose anyone. And it, it continues here. It says, um, on one side of the road, a mum ushers her two daughters into Lidl. The three of them clad in matching face coverings. On the other, a woman um, hovers outside the shop front, sussing out the sales assistant whether she can come in or, cut or go without. Keep distance, please, reads a sign in a window. On a Regini Patel stationery shop, she says all she can do is ask customers to wear face coverings, but some of the older customers in particular don't listen. <laughs> I guess this is the... That's that's one of the things that you just you never think about when you're young. I remember that was something I was prone to doing when I was in school. We all did it. Innit? You're in school and you hear, innit? especially when you're 16 and you hear of somebody that's like 24, you think they're about to die, innit? You're just like, wow, man, you're so old. Then you suddenly get to 24 and you're like, you know, everything looks so young to you. But you also have those interactions where you bump into an older person that's above the age of like 60, 70, and he just could give no fucks for any sort of like, you know, um social etiquette they don't care for it right they've lived a long life they've seen loads of things the last thing they're going to do is bend and co you know you know and cower to your demands they don't care if they if there's no if there's no um green man they will just cross the middle of the street if they die they die most likely someone's gonna you know hot skid to a halt somewhere um if they're requested to wear face masks because of an invisible virus they don't really believe it's true due to all their friends on facebook they don't care if they get it it's probably going to be a blessing in disguise for them because they're living in constant pain so something you realize a lot with old people man i can't wait until i get to that age i really can't uh it says it continues it says keep your distance um she says one customer was even aggressive when she reminded him about social distancing she says there's no point in saying anything to anybody you don't want to get in trouble yeah true bless the woman um she says 100 miles away in birmingham another shopper laura told bbc fire radio live that she'd been in branch of the supermarket aldi this morning um where a couple of people weren't wearing face covering she didn't approve hopefully she didn't snitch of course she said if there's even a remote possibility that wearing a mask can induce infection race then it's worth it it's not a hardship she added yeah it's true but it's just a different way of i've stopped really trying to think i've i've stopped trying to um psychoanalyze it it's just what it is isn't it some people just don't want to wear it some people are more than happy to wear it um the ones that don't want to wear it they don't really have any real rational reason not to they just don't want to right they have these far-fetched you know conspiracy ideas or conspiracy theories um there's a thing about free will and you know that sort of stuff but for the most part they just don't want to wear it and i think that they're perfectly within their right to do that um i think spending your time trying to berate people to do something that you're doing is just a waste of time just you do it and keep it moving um it's sort of like it, it reminds me of that trope in horror movies where there's that person that clearly doesn't doesn't listen or clearly doesn't believe the threat that's outside that looms outside but then there's another person that's trying to convince them that that threat is real and more often than not both of those people characters get killed because you know the other one's just too nosy just leave that person alone they're in the grown adult if they decide to go out there where the monsters lie because they want to have a piss or stretch their legs then let them in it uh, he continues just says meanwhile listener paul said he had been on the receiving end of some mask outrage this morning he said in maidenhead Bay berkshire where he went into a tesco without a mask covering after a bike ride he said it was an honest mistake but a fellow shopper berated me she just went to town on me paul said i've been rightly scolded okay that's fair enough i think that's why i try to do my running in the morning or away from people i think it it kind of helps um plus i just don't think people expect you to wear it when you're running or cycling but i have done i have done this thing where if i'm running and i'm gonna go to a shop i'll make sure i'll, I'll carry a little spare um you know face marks a little snood with me just so i can use that when i go into a store just for my own little you know for my own protection because there is a part of me that's thinking hmm if i just finished running a running somewhere more than a mile let's say i'm gonna be perspirating i'm gonna be breathing quite heavily so i'm probably prone to getting something and especially with my pre-existing conditions you know being um being suffering from asthma and you know having to have i had like a what what i have a deviated septum back in the day from falling off a skateboard or some shit so 
I'm one of the prime candidates to get this bloody thing in it. So I've got to keep myself in tip top shape and make sure I avoid all those things. But it's a hard thing to remember in it, especially if you're on a bike ride to have a mask in your back pocket. Like, especially if it's not one that you wear anyway, like a sports one, it's just like a regular one you wear. Cause you're not going to be able to wear that when you're cycling and that you're going to, you're going to probably make yourself pass out. Um, but anyway, it continues. It says, like many shopping areas across the country, stores in Liverpool, one complex, um, have put up signs telling customers to wear face coverings. But Susan Green, 257 of Liverpool, said, I think it's a little bit late to have introduced this. Lots of people I've seen this morning of not even wearing one, which is, she's got a point, to be fair. She said, continues, um, I won't be put off coming to the shops because I'll be out anyway, but it does seem a bit unnecessary. Liverpool One also has new vending machines selling face mask coverings in multiple styles and they have sprung up in other streets too. Of course they have. Of course the capitalists have come in and inserted another means for them to acquire more money from us that we don't even have. Of course they've done it. And I bet you they are way, way above inflation. I bet you they're way above market value, these flipping masks. I bet the same mask you can grab for a couple of quid off Amazon. I bet they're going to sell it for you, you know, for your own convenience 999 99 99 10 99 12 99 these motherfucking oh they don't know when to stop do they um it says here back in Corn camberwell at the scope charity shop dawn Suleiman says one says only one customer has come in today without a face covering and was grateful when she handed her a spare oh that's awesome a spare one what do you mean like a one that you're using and you're lending it to her or one that you had do you remember in the beginning when corona was still spreading in in parts of china and we didn't really believe what was going on and we saw all those crazy images of like people being dragged outside their houses and being put into like equivalent of like a you know a human-sized freezer or you know a human-sized portal cabin and locked in there so that they can go to um quarantine by force right um they were breaking into people's houses they weren't answering the door to make sure to check up to, to check up on them and then i remember seeing this other video of this woman on the street a street vendor who had basically bought face masks from like a factory somewhere no she had picked up face masks from a factory bin somewhere right they had been used in the hospital or something and she washed them and then she was reselling them on the street to people right and it was horrible you're like oh disgusting and, this, and i think this is when people were like you know um asian hating they're like oh these chinese people it's their fault they're eating bats and they gave us corona but no when you when you when you found that the actual whole part of the story was that that lady um i think all of her family members especially the men had all passed away so there was no one there was no breadwinner in the house and she had a, a couple of babies at home or one baby at home um that that um luckily survived and she was selling those masks in order to feed her children and it completely changed the the context of, it completely changed the, the story because you had some context to it um i remember that being a thing i was like bloody hell and this when you heard a thing of people actually washing face masks that they found uh, because there was a shortage of them at the time like imagine that imagine having to share a face mask it's bad enough people um i don't know go halves on a cigarette sometimes right in the best of times imagine having to share a face mask oh yeah i'll take it in the morning you take it in the evening or oh, do you know that face can i borrow yours please because i've lost mine like what madness um it continues as she agrees that it might not be wise to challenge customers since there have been um, instances where staff have been verbally abused for asking shoppers to use hand sanitizer pumps really bloody hell that's the least you could do um to leaning over to tap the counter on her left she says so far today touch wood we've not had any problems um she said i wouldn't say some i wouldn't say to somebody you can't come in because you don't have a face mask says dawn who is exempt when she goes shopping because she suffers from asthma okay i didn't know that i'd explain to them you do realize that you should probably get in like get a fine and if you haven't got a mask i'm happy to give you one okay that's fine fair enough but i guess it's hard if you're a shopkeeper and you don't have one and then someone else you're telling people to wear one what do you have to wear like a asthma badge like you know those um badges that um expected mums wear when on the underground like you know i'm pregnant or whatever it's called was that no watch out baby on board or something right so what do you have to <laughs> wear one of those when you're on the train now watch out asthma suffer about watch out sneeze coming through watch out had you had you had you or watch you and is that a good one is that a good plan watch you or should i get my jacket and leave i'll get my jacket give me <laughs> she says i want it anyway the damn 
Melanie Wall from um, from Chloe James Boutique in St. Album says there's been a great reaction among her shop customers. People are very happy to wear face masks. It sparks conversation and banter when they come in. We talk about different styles. Yeah, all right. Calm down, love. Melanie's obviously chatting shit. Banter about face. How long is that gonna last? One week, a day? Oh, face. Oh, wow, amazing! I love you. I love yours. Where did you get yours from? I made it. Oh, really? Yeah, I made it. With some spare fabric I got in the garden. Blah, blah, blah. And then that's it. Like, how much more conversations can you? How many? Or may? Or you know what? This might be the replacement for those, um, mundane, you know, brain splattering, boring conversations you have when you get to work. You know those conversations people have when they come back when they back from work or from holiday or from or from a long weekend. It's like, oh, what do you get up to? And it's always the most, you know, vanilla bullshit surface level stuff. Um, no one really wants to hear the truth of it. Everyone's lying for the most part. Everyone's embellishing their stories somewhat, right? And then you go through this sort of dance, you know, even if you do have a story, what is it really? You went to go meet some friends that your colleague doesn't know. There's no, what are you going to do? Spend the next 10 minutes telling them who your friends are, then explaining why that joke is funny, then explaining why you went over there. It just doesn't make any sense. So you try and give it, you try and give it a surface of an explanation as possible. You do this little trade and then you both leave happy that you've had a conversation with your work friend. The same with the prior, if you're a shop owner, right? These sort of like jovial exchanges you have with shoppers, it's just a way to you to, I don't know, you feel alive again because you spend most of the time at home with no customers or you spend some time in a shop with, any, with nobody coming in there. So the one thing that you're happy about is seeing strangers walking into your store and giving you some love. Even if they don't even buy, even if they don't end up buying some overpriced necklace from you that you handmade from shells you picked up on the beach somewhere in the middle of Cornwall, at least they've come in and said hi, isn't it? That's a good thing. <laughs> this lady is an absolute... She's got the face of somebody as well that would expect someone to make a, a comment about her face mask, in it? Not to be mean, but you know, Jesus. Uh, people are very happy to say the way of face masks. It sparks conversation and banter when they come in. We talk about different styles. It's been really, it's been very well accepted. We do have a lady who's approached us the front door and said, um, I haven't got a face mask, but I'm here to buy one. Uh, she obviously couldn't come into the shop, but I served her from the doorstep. So it was a really lovely, funny moment. Yuck, man. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Imagine being an adult and being this corny, huh? Being this dorky. I'd hate that. I just wanna I've always had a dream where when I was an adult or when I was a grown up, I would always imagine and I think I'm still the same. I'll just I'll just be a kid an adult version of what I am, of what I was when I was a kid. I wouldn't want to suddenly grow up and become this like, you know, that fuddy daddy, boring, giggling over f different patterns. You know, you wear you wear some cheetah print. You know, you wear some stripy shirt, trousers at work, and everyone's like, "Wow, she really needs a dress. She's a really wacky dresser." It's like, get the fuck out of here, man. Get a personality. God damn it. Um, says meanwhile another person. Meanwhile, one shopper in the city told BBC she was really pleased with the rules have come in. I think it's given us more confidence to come into town. We've been avoiding it up until now. Fair enough. Fair enough, but yeah, more comments there. I won't read the whole thing, but that's what we're doing here in the UK to try and combat it. We are all wearing face masks indoors to make sure that we get this thing under some level of control so that we can get back to normal in it, whatever that is. But hey, so far, so good. Next on the list, we have Twitter are testing a subscription or a paid for service, right? They want to up their revenues, they want to up their cash making abilities because surprisingly, which I didn't think about, um they're having some issues making money during the pandemic i didn't actually think it would affect them i thought the the actual opposite right people being at home um not able to go anywhere working from home that they'd be spending more time on their phone because i think that's gone up I remember seeing a, an article once saying that um overall phone usage has gone up and i'm sure you probably noticed it yourself with your own phone when you do your stats at the end of the week you probably notice a, a real surge in the amount of time you spend on your smartphone so you would have thought that would be the issue but i guess the problem they're having is that um the they make most of their money on Twitter, I guess, from advertisers. And advertiser spend has obviously gone down due to the pandemic because they're not being able to sell whatever they're selling on their side to justify them spending a lot of money on marketing, which usually that kind of advertising, you know, we try, I've, I work in that, I've worked in that industry before, I work in the industry still now at the moment, and you can always promise numbers, but for most of the time, for most of the a time you are just guessing you are just trying stuff out experimenting doing different kinds of campaigns um in in the hope that you will achieve those numbers that you've kind of set out or taking into consideration the stuff you've done previously and obviously given you know using the analytics to kind of um 
to shape what you do in the future but it is a bit of a guessing game so when sales go down the first thing that gets cut is marketing spend right it's sort of like a nice to have so they have obviously been suffering from that because people aren't advertising that means basically everyone's just using the twitter service for free but they've obviously seen an uptick in daily usages so it's an interesting conundrum and i was thinking how would they go about interesting a paid for subscription model would they do something that involved a kind of like a sub stacks um sort of uh, way of doing things where certain basically Substack is a newsletter a paid for newsletter platform where different editors and writers well but different writers independent writers can basically use the platform to send newsletters to a dedicated uh, list of people that they have signed up to it some editors allow you to read a couple of free articles a month to kind of you know acquire you get you interested so you could subscribe and then they can set the price or however much they want it to be um and then you have the other model which was which one was the other model i was thinking about the other model was the medium medium obviously have another uh paid for option too that you can use so you can obviously read articles on medium um of which you know publishes articles from everybody you can basically sign up on there sort of like a a much fancier version of a blog spot um where people usually write kind of op-ed sort of pieces a little bit more thought out um opinion pieces i can put out there so there's an option for you to pay for that too some writers obviously have their articles behind a paywall and then i think the last person that does a paid for subscription that i had written down in here was patron and only fans which are pretty self-explanatory so i wonder how they're going to do the operation what they're going to put forth what kind of model they're going to use because i'd imagine because from what i've seen so far people online when they the story broke especially on twitter like oh i'm not going to use it anymore i'm going to leave but you know people say a lot of stuff but they don't actually follow through it so i think buyer behavior will dictate that or user behavior will dictate that and i think for the most part the ups the uptick in you know twitter especially with the trump being on there and all the politics and all the cancellations that get that happen on there on an almost weekly basis i think twitter's here to stay right it serves a purpose i think maybe a few years prior when it looked like it was down in the dumps but i think since the election especially the u.s elections or even brexit i think um twitter has come into its own especially you know globally as well it's sort of captured the imagination and it's, and it's definitely carved out its own little space within the social media ecosystem so with that said i don't think people will leave the app on mass if it went switch to pay to they could obviously have an option where they allow certain users to um certain users above a certain follower account maybe verified user i don't know to have certain maybe would you would you have it like certain users are allowed to no you would have an option that allowed users to sign up to your a subscription only feed that you'd put behind a paywall and then maybe that would be the place where you i don't know you put up some not safe for work opinions right um that you kind of only shared on there or if you were let's say uh you're one of those bitcoin entrepreneurs and you wanted to have a feed specifically just for your um you know your your clients who wanted to have some investment advice on you know what to do with cryptocurrency and you didn't want to have you know some um unruly eyes you know you didn't have to want to have some quote-unquote detractors come on board and start to uh, tell your clients that maybe you're a bit of a charlatan you probably put that behind a paywall i don't know maybe or even just the adult entertainers they could also use that as too as an option to maybe funnel along your users to only fans by you know making them go behind a paywall and giving them some discounts and then kind of funneling them across but let's find out what cnn says this article from cnn says twitter says it's looking at subscription options as ad revenues drop sharply um it says the yeah, twitter is actively exploring additional ways to make money from its users including by considering a subscription model ceo jack dorsey said on thursday the move comes as twitter suffers a sharp decline in its core advertiser business you will likely see some tests this year of various approaches dorsey said uh, to analysts on an investor call held today uh, to discuss the bit, the company's second quarter earnings dorsey said he has a really high bar for when he would ask the consumers to pay for aspects of twitter but confirmed that the company is seeking to diversify sources of revenue in what uh, are very very early phase of exploring now obviously there's some people would argue oh they couldn't even implement an uh, edit button so don't expect the paid for service anytime soon i think for the most part especially some of the features they've added lately you know with um, the ability to do a threaded post um pretty easily the idea the ability to quote reply on pictures and article links the ability to save stuff from bookmarks you know, you'd be able to do that already before was i really like they've done um 
they still don't, they still don't allow you to have a chronological feed, which is annoying. But I guess that's a bit of a superpower, and they they that's they want the advantage. They want the ability to basically pump stuff to your timeline in terms of promoted uh, tweets and stuff. So it makes sense, maybe. Um, and maybe they decided as well, like if they give you a chronological feed and you don't get any updates on your timeline, then you're gonna use the app again. Whereas if they basically give you their feed, right, based on um based on your behaviors online you're maybe more of likely to basically stay on there i don't know but that's probably one thing to think about as i'll continue the article it says early this month rumors flared about a pay twitter option after the company posted a job opening focus on building a subscription platform codenamed uh gyrophone twitter's stock surged at the time signaling an investor appetite for the company to find a new revenue stream that's pretty cool and they find out about a new feature mainly because of job postings shares of twitter said rose at four percent in early trading on thursday following the earnings result like that several um like its rival social networks twitter has focused on offering a free service and making money by allowing brands to target assets millions and users which is a great business model when it really is. you have a free social network you hope it kind of blows up and then once you have an active user base with people coming on there you know it kind of speaks for itself you don't need to see the numbers but if you want to see the numbers i'm sure the numbers are pretty impressive um about you know the amount of people that log into the twitter app every single day or post or engage or in any kind of way or form and then you kind of sell that to the highest bidder because you know you can claim to reach them which you can't really for the most part but hey you know, we've all, we've all got to make these decisions ourselves. It says, it continues, it says, um, we want to make sure any new line of revenue is complementary to our advertising business. Dorsey said, we do think there is a world where subscription is complementary, where comments is complementary, where helping people manage walls, paywalls is complementary, where fitness is complementary. Well, it's a, it's a really, um, it's a really mean task, man, to try and implement that and make it work and try and make it complement each side of Twitter because, you know, part of the reason why Twitter works so amazingly is that, you know, there are different aspects of it that co sort of complement each other from following people that are heavily into a, a certain subject from following people from that into a certain you know field of interest whatever it may be it kind of all complements each other without it really being a feature that twitter have sort of implemented it's kind of something that the user base has sort of carved out themselves it feels like i don't know maybe i'm just kind of reading into that a bit too much but that's why i think but it continues here it says twitter's growth plans are under close scrutiny as advertisers pulled back due to the pandemic on thursday to a report a quarter ad revenue of 56 562 million dollars a 23 percent decrease compared to the same quarter a year ago bloody hell imagine losing 23 percent of that amount five six eight million due to a pandemic god damn you've got to figure out something you've got to figure something out in it you've got to get those paid ads in that's all you can sorry you got to get a paid subscription model in um reoccurring funds lock people into a direct um debit sort of thing and hope for the best in it but how i wonder what could be a good price range to price something like that for a couple of dollars five dollars would it go up would it be something that would it only be aimed at certain i guess you could make it something i don't know would it be something like same as like a beginner verified badge where it's something that regular users will think is an aspirational thing to have like a paid subscription option on your account i don't know let's see what happens anyway but i thought that was an interesting one so like i said the other day it's affecting pret manger this pandemic boots twitter like everyone's suffering apart from who i don't know snapchat seems to be all right in it for some reason just when you whenever there's a report about snapchat dying it just seems to just carry on I don't know how that business works, man. They raised so much money in the stock market, right? And when they when they IPO'd, and they don't really make that much money, I'd imagine, for advertisers, unless advertisers spend a bucket load of cash because they seem to have, they seem to have a complete monopoly on anyone under the age of eighteen in it, Snapchat. So maybe they could justify really high rates, and the companies could justify spending it because that's an actual um, captive audience for real, for real. But they don't have enough. They don't have that much disposable income. It's a strange one, really. I don't know how that works. I really don't. Because even if you're marketing to kids, it's not like they have money to spend. They're spending their parents' money, right? I'm assuming. Like, I, I assume the wide, the, the mass majority of kids on that platform are just regular, you know, everyday kids. I don't really, I don't, I don't know. Do they have jobs? Would they still have them now? Who knows? But that's something. That's what I always kind of think about. Like, how are, how are they still surviving Snapchat? But you know, those guys are way smarter than I am, so I'm sure they figured something out. Next on the list, we have this amazing news that Uber 
purchase Postmates. This broke a while back, but I've had this on here for a while and I've kind of been thinking about it often, um, mainly because I've always wanted Postmates to launch in the UK or Europe at least, right? You always hear these great stories about Postmates in the US and I just think in terms of a concept, especially here, it would work amazing, like, you know, the ability for you to um, request a pickup of certain items from smaller stores because Uber works pretty cool in the UK, right, or in London. You know, if you have a city or a town in London where there's a high concentration of really cool, um, you know, restaurants and stores that you can eat at, then it's really great to have Uber or delivery service, right? Because those um, restaurants, when you're having a day where you don't really feel like going out, you can have that food delivered to your home or a modified menu, right? So it works pretty well in London, pretty simply. But I think there's also a scope, especially with the amount of, I think this, my thinking came from the fact that you would go to like an after hours, right? Or a house party or a warehouse event, or you'd go to, I don't know, you'd just be out in general. And you'd it, it would come to a point where people are now w looking for a place to go and no, looking for a shop to go to. But usually if you live in London anyway, for the most part, there is usually one or two 24 hour news agents that are usually open that can sell you anything from cigarettes to alcohol or to, you know, confectionaries. But they're usually way, way far away from where you are. It's mostly that happens in it. The shop that you want is nowhere near where you want to be. Um, or you have to walk a strong distance to get there. So Postmates would be a great option because, you know, you could um, essentially get someone to pick up something menial that you wouldn't necessarily be able to pick up in a normal restaurant because they wouldn't be open. And they could obviously charge you a little bit more premium for it. It might be, let's say, standard um, delivery is like a six quid or five pounds but there'll be a lot of customers for it I definitely think so there'll be a lot of customers that'll be down for it and and it probably makes more sense for Uber to purchase Postmates as a sort of add-on so they don't have to build out that entire feature on uh, themselves right because I guess you'd have to build something else like an, an add-on or a feature or maybe another app um, in order to make that sort of like um, um, in order to make that sort of delivery service work for smaller stores but this is an article here from the New York Times it stipulates that Uber buys Postmates for 2.65 billion dollars mamma mia so it says yeah um, Uber's agreed to acquire the food delivery startup Postmates for 2.65 billion dollars as it aims to expand its presence in the on-demand food delivery while its core rider hailing business struggles oh I didn't know that actually okay they're propping it up so the company announced an all-stock deal on Monday morning Uber will combine Postmates into its own delivery subsidiary Uber Eats which has been growing and during coronavirus period of the pandemic Postmates will continue to operate under its own name that's amazing food delivery apps which connect drivers restaurants and customers have grown quickly in recent years fueled by venture capital and armies of contract workers but the apps offer very um, similar services leading to heavy competition and pressure to keep fees low i definitely agree with that one um, it says while more people have been using delivery services during the pandemic profits have been exclusive elusive as a result that every app companies have circled one another aiming to make deals to gain scale personally it's privately discuss uh, possible deals with doordash the largest service in the united states and another rival grubhub according to two people in knowledge of those talks interesting that grubhub is that big in the us and it's or doordash as well it's not that big here in the uk um I, i'd imagine uber is the number one in or in the uk for the most part europe we had you know europe there's loads of little start little local startups that have done there and think that it's kind of taken off i think even parts of spain they don't even use an uber they have another app they use as well so it definitely changes depending on where you've been at but it's mad a competition in the us isn't it post may store dash grubhub uber eats crazy it continues it says in recent months uber also discussed buying grubhub but last month grubhub was instead stalled to just eat takeaway a european delivery company for 7.3 billion God almighty, he said, to together Postmates and Uber Eats would have 37% share of the delivery sales in the United States, according to Edison Trends, which tracks credit card spending. DoorDash would remain the largest uh, player with 45%, while Grubhub would have 17 So, yeah, so in order to survive, it seems like they've they all done some sort of what, back behind, uh, backroom deal, where they kind of agreed to kind of buy each other out. I'm not sure if there was any favours really made, you know, it's not you're not doing someone a favor by lending them 2.6 or by giving them 2.65 million billion sorry i don't think that is a favor it continues here it says uber is looking for growth as people stay home during the pandemic and it's rather hailing business struggles in may 
Oh, okay, that's what they mean. So I thought they meant Uber Eats. So I guess Uber encapsulates Uber Eats itself. They're not separate companies. Duh. It continues to say they may Uber posted a $2.6 billion loss for the first three months of the year and announced that it was laying off 14% of its workforce. God almighty. But revenue of its uh, Uber Eats division rose 53%. From April to June, Uber said bookings for Uber Eats more than doubled compared to from the year earlier. Daniel Ivers, an industry analyst at Wedbush, at Wedbush Security said in a note that to clients that the deal was a defensive and offensive acquisition in the food delivery space. Food by the time it's a core ride sharing business, um, seeing massive headwinds in the COVID 19 pandemic. Now, for lack of a better term, if, would I be um, misplaced in saying that this is a very Travis Kalanick move, right? The former CEO and founder of Uber. It seems like a very aggressive move that he would have done, right? Super ballsy. You see that you're floundering. You see that you're kind of, you know, dying out there. And you see a really ripe, um, you know, galloping gazelle striding near you. And you drag it down and you kind of say, hey, I'm going to give you $2.6 billion if you join my team. And they, and they obviously acquiesce because that's, you know, that's a life-changing amount of money. Especially for an app that had a really, really small market share in the U.S. Postmates, right? They tended to only really operate within the coastal areas, um, certain states, so for them to be sold for 2.65 is flipping incredible considering their, you know, the size of their operation. Um, blah, 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 blah. Postmates have valued investors, was valued by investors at 2.5 billion. It's smaller than the other players with about 10 million customers. Founded in 2011, it was among the first startups to use the part-time gig workers to deliver customers wherever they wanted at a tap of a smartphone button. <clears throat> Pierre Gore, Pierre Dimitri Gorkotti, the Uber head of food delivery, will continue to run the global delivery business. Uber said Bastian Lainham, Lainham, the chief executive of Postmates, will stay on board uh, during a regulatory review of the deal. Long-term in inter integration plans are still being worked out, according to Uber. In announcing the deal, the company shared the final details about Postmates. In the first quarter of 2020, Postmates had a revenue of 107 million, more than 1100, more than 115,000 uh, merchants who use the platform. Uber said Postmates had performed especially well in the Southwest, including Phoenix, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and San Diego. Um, Dara, whatever her name is, there, I can't pronounce that. Uber chief executive said Uber might integrate Postmate certain Postmate services, including its nine per nine per nine nine per month subscription that provides no delivery fee on any orders above twelve. That's a clever little thing, there. And you can expect to see some of these tactics at Uber each. He said, "We think it's just a wonderful combination." Postmates has raised more than nine hundred million in funding from investors, including Spark Capital, Tiger Mountain Management. According to PitchBook, it had filed to go public. Wow. Just in time, innit? Just in time. And they paid a bit more. So it's valued at two, what, 2.6, they said on here? 2.4. And they sold for what? 2.65. So they got a few milli extra on top of it. What a deal. So let's see what happens then. Eh? Uber eats per Uber has purchased, sorry, Postmates. Um, I'm assuming this is going to affect its operations in Europe too. But let's see what happens to it in the US. I wonder if it's going to negatively affect Postmates or if it's going to be a good addition. Moving on up a moon to break free. Da, 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 da. Okay, what else we want to talk about here? We want to talk about Cold War Dr. Martins. They're already out anyway. I'm sure some of you have probably seen them, but just as an image, <clears throat> I thought they looked really cool. So a cold a cold war, the brand founded by um the one Samuel Samuel Ross has um managed to collaborate with dr martin which is a pretty um unexpected collaboration but once you see the shoe it does make a lot of sense considering uh cold war's aesthetic which is really cool and i do think it's um a signifier of an evolution of the brand right um a cold war came into the market or came into the scene um with his first couple of runway shows with sammy ross essentially what buying pairs of white air force ones and sort of you know customizing them himself over dyeing them taking off the laces adding some labels on them and just you know kind of um what they're calling it what does it say in america freaking them up a bit right and um that was the aesthetic that it was kind of you know you kind of uh associated with a cold war right and then you'd get op-eds or you get reviews of the brand stating that it was a you know post streetwear brand and you know you'd get some pushback from samuel ross who wouldn't really want to be you know pigeonholed as just a streetwear brand and 
I guess he stopped saying that sort of stuff and instead just proved it on the runway. And then season in, season out, you got to see a kind of an increase and a refinement in the vision. Um, he started to really level up. And now you've seen, especially with the um, introduction of their own inline footwear that they have now at the moment, that is completely, you know, um, it's completely sort of against any classic sort of streetwear model or shoe or, yeah, that you'd kind of ex expect from a streetwear brand. And now you see this Dr. Martin and you think, okay, cool, they've definitely made a transition. You know, they've definitely kind of just naturally done it over a period of time. And I guess the Dr. Martin shoes is a good signifier for that, again, in my opinion. This is from um, ID Magazine. So the Cold War reimagined the Dr. Martin's classic 1460 boot. And, you know, you're more than probably familiar with a 1460 boot that they've sort of reworked with the addition of a zip. And it looks like the laces are enclosed maybe underneath or they don't have the laces on top. But regardless, a really clean silhouette with... Um, the stitching on the midsole tonal as well in black you've got the black sole the sort of translucent black sole which is a bit different from the sole you get on a regular um dr martin's a sort of clear or yellowy tint they've gone for a completely monochrome boot and it looks beautiful um it's a short article from id it says since uh first launched six years ago dr martin's and 460 have earned a reputation as one of the blah blah okay so let's move on it says uh it's this proximity to fashion culture that's led to the it initiation of dr martin's 460 red master collaboration series which is a great idea something i think they should have done previously but i'm not sure if they've got because they always have some very interesting creative directors that like dr martin's people that you would have kind of known of or heard of working in other places but they seem to keep it close to their chest but Dr. Mines is such a is such one is one of those kind of brands that has the ability to, you know, they're probably at an advantage because there's a lot of brands they could collaborate with in the industry from menswear to fashion to streetwear that they could sort of like do deals with or even some skateboard brands that would work well with them. Um, they kind of occupy that real sweet spot in lifestyle that can kind of, you know, work well with different brands regardless of their um, area of expertise. So it'd be interesting to see how much more they do of these uh, remastered um, collaboration series. It continues, says, um, through which singular menswear designers have been invited to reinterpret the classic boot. As the seventh uh, collaborator in the series, the Northamptonshire-based footwear brand has enlisted Sami Ross of a Cold War. He follows in the footsteps of designers like Yoji Yamamoto, undercover John Takashi. Okay, cool. Yeah, we saw the Takashi ones before, it's actually. It continues, it says, an ideal pairing given Samuel's renown for through, uh, for thorough investigation into British culture. It's like, guys. He says uh, the 1460 is placed right in the middle of 21st century cultural crosshairs. He says, and it's exactly um, this hybridity he's chosen to exploit. For his take on it, Samuel has respected its traditional status as a staple of the working class uniform, subtly transforming it by way of his trademark modern architectural approach to design and nods to high end tailoring. Crafted with pointed angular features, no eyelets, and an added zip side zip, it's one of those most unorthodox collaborations to date, reads the release. This collaboration explores new construction and pattern techniques, says Darren McKay, Dr. Martin's global footwear director. Okay, that's the guy that's in charge, then that's the charge of the collaboration. So, well done, Mr. Mr. McCoy, um, global director, I said to you, Sammy Ross is a master of the art of refinement. Here, he's refined a 1460 through his creative lens, and I guess it's pretty tasty. I'm, I'm interested to see how it's going to fit without the um, eyelets or without the laces. I'm also interested to see whether or not, once you unzip it in the middle, if there is like a latches or elastic on the side to keep your foot in. If there's one thing that I would say from wearing, I know, I've worn Dr. Martin boots for a really long period of my life. I worked in the stores there for a very, very long time too when I had just left university. Um, one thing I know about the boot is that, you know, they they are pretty, you know, depending on your foot, depending on how you wear boots, they can be an absolute bitch to break in. So if there's one shoe that you could get away with not having laces with, it's a 1460. Like you don't really need a lace to wear with them, to be honest, especially when you get them new. Um, and with the addition of the zip as well, you can obviously kind of fern them up a little bit. You don't need to zip them up to the top, I'd imagine. I'd imagine my fat foot probably would have fit all the way to the top. But they've also got a zip on the side you mentioned here, right? They said, yeah, a zip on the side, no eyelets, and an added side zip. Yeah, so there's a zip at the front here, and I'm assuming one towards the side that you can also use. But yeah, so far, I'm a big fan of them. Man. They're meant to come out when? July 25th, so they would have been out already. Um, if you have been able to get a pair, then let me know if you've got them in the comments, how they fit, what you like about them. But I do think it's a good um, representation or evolution of what Cold War have been doing these past few years, man. They've been smashing it. They really have. Um, it's definitely a big, big, big level up. And it kind of reminds me of these. 
um, Dr. Martin Boots that they did previously with um, Vetima. I'm not sure if this was part of the collaboration too they did previously. Do you remember the ones that had like um, that had no security or something? I think I got them. I got them here on the screen. They were laceless as well. Was that what was that? Was that fourteen ninety? It's a ten hole, right? What is that one? Is that fourteen twenty? I should know the numbers, but so essentially, it's a, sort of the same approach that uh, Sam Rosa did, but he's a Cold War collaboration. But in this, I'm not sure if they've Samuel does I'm not sure if they've kind of fused those the tongue and the eyelids together, whether or not they've been heat pressed, I'm not too sure. But there's a side zip there, ten hole Dr. Martin. Again, both gone for the chrono chro, um which monochromatic look on the outsole and the upper, you know, black stitching on the black midsole. But they've obviously gone for the weathered boot on the upper to make them look like they've been used. And then if you scan through the other pictures, yeah, that's it, you got borderline written down the back of the boots. They were bloody incredible when they popped. I think this was 2017, I'm going to say, for Winter Vetima, where they had all those collaborations. But one of my favourites, I'm not sure if these are part of it, but it's a long collaboration. If this was from 2017, they're still doing the same series. Maybe it's an ongoing thing they just keep doing with different brands. And then I remember them in a runway. Quickly show you here. That was the runway look. Da, 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 from Yeah, that was here for Vetima for 2017. So oh no, spring twenty seventeen, my bad. One of one of the one of the better collections from Vetema from that era as well. Classic, classic Vetema shapes here. Um that hoodie was incredibly popular for a while. Do you remember that Antwerp hoodie they sort of re redid? And those are the shoes there, if you can see them now, I'll zoom in a little bit. Yeah, those are the boots there worn by the model, tucked in a little bit, like such a such a good collection, man. Super underrated. This is that era when that's that period when I, when I essentially fell in love with Vetema. Loved everything about it. The slouchy, boxy fits. Um, the what you call it? The absolute madness he does with the proportions, like just incredible, all of it. But loads of them are collaborations. I'm pretty sure that one was the what was that collaboration? Canada Goose, I'm sure. Um, there's a few of them there floating around in that collab, yeah. But definitely one for the history books. A lot of stuff in here has definitely been put in people's grey or archives. I'm pretty sure, but yeah. Let's see what Samuel Ross does with his ones. And again, if you've got them, definitely let me know. I want to see or hear about how you acquired them. Did you pay for them? Did you pre-order via the Cold War website or did you get them somewhere else? Let me know. So let's move on. What else we got here? Da, 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 da. Oh, we've got some trainers. A collaboration with Carefree and Mizuno. Um, I actually know the guy that runs Carefree, so big up Damien for these. I didn't actually know there was his brand at first. I kind of just saw them or hype beast and thought, oh, these are flipping amazing. Um, you've got the classic '90s colorway on a Mizuno, which I've been, I've been um a fan. I've been kind of keeping an eye on what Mizuno been doing. They've been retroing some really, really great runner shape from, you know, from their archives they've been putting out. Really expertly done. They've really paid attention to the idea of re when you re when you retro an old shoe, try and at least, you know, get the shape right. If you can't get the materials or you can't get the, you know, the colors right, at least get the shape of it right. So you have that nice, classic, flat 90 silhouettes. It's not pointing up like a banana like Nike used to do back in the day with their retros. So they're really taking care of their uh, retros and how they're bringing them out and dropping them, you know, incrementally here and there. And I guess um, this is a great way to do it, you know, collaborating with a smaller brand in Carefree um, and then using it as a way to kind of introduce the market to this Mizuno Sky Medal. Um, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant shoe, man. It, it reminds me of the bad kind of day when you first saw an Asics Gel Light. You remember when that was a new shape, you're like, damn. And I think this is up there. It's really, really beautiful. It'll be. It's a shame because a lot of sneaky kids, you know, these days they tend to all buy the same models. You know, Jordan ones, Yeezys, and stuff. Um, if you know, it, all it takes is one one of those cool kids that everyone follows online to wear a pair of these, and they'll completely blow it. But I'm happy that people are not kind of paying that much attention to them because it means I'll be able to get them easily. But they're really nice, man. Mizuno Sky Medals. This article here from Hype it said Damien Malentier, uh London-based label. Carefree has combined with its layback aesthetic with Mizuno's heritage to create a fittingly 90s uh, Sky Medal sneaker. The Mizuno Sky Medal is constructed from a mixture of white leather and Jasper green, which I'm also been a fan of. And that sort of Ke Jasper Kelly green sort of colorway on a 90s shoe is just like beautiful. And mesh um, synthetic materials that appear in bright colors. Uh, Malentine 
Malontai has made the pair look as original as possible. The toe box is finished in white mesh. The Midian logo on the side serves plenty of the retro feels with its glossy fading red colorway. And even the campaign imagery oozes 90s silhouette. Yeah, uh, that is actually, sorry, it looks really cool, man. It reminds me of those, in those old uh, catalog pictures you'd see in like Japanese magazines or, or athletic store magazines or something. Really cool. It continues says, on a rear sneaker you'll find the carefree signature logo which I'm always a big fan of the little logo on the back from the brand uh, while the um, aglets with the finished black branding the embroidered Mizuna branding blah, 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 blah. take a look at the carefree Mizuna medal pairs are available and metal websites now while stocks last um, further info releases will come via the raffle at Hanon and BTSN the carefree Mizuna sky medal reaches at 120 such a good shoe man it's already out at the moment definitely check him out and support the guy man because that's a brilliant 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 shoe Mizuno carefree there Sky Medal next on the list let's whack through some more Nike yeah Nike da did that already what else have we got here did that did this oh let's do this one so um talking about talking about talking about talking about, talking about, talking about, talking about all things considering the la comedy scene so as you guys are familiar i think most of you probably should have known by now but the rumors are true joe rogan and co are leaving la and they're moving to texas so as most of you will probably be aware if you're a joe rogan podcast fan and you're a fan of the fire and the kid and the joey diaz and that whole extended group you'd have known that you know some of those guys have been insufferable during covid right um they've been denying the severity of the issue they've been bemoaning their local governors and mayors of their because of their approach and what they've done in reacting to it the fact that the comedy stores closed the fact that they can't tour they've just been whining and complaining right these multi-millionaires who from the looks of it are living an easy life have find have kind of um, reminded us that they're just human like you or I and they also need uh, the ability to feed their families right regardless if they get paid a million per gig you still need to work in order to kind of make sure you keep paying your light bill and make sure the bailiffs don't take away your home or take away your kids right so it's completely does make sense but then it, there was a bit of hope at the end of the tunnel because when LA was closing and things weren't looking bright um, on the west coast it did seem like places in the south or in the sun belt places in Texas places like Texas and the like were opening up and kind of going back to normal but then um, just as they were kind of speaking about uh, moving away the numbers in Texas have sort of spiked over the last few weeks it feels like LA is kind of locked down again for a second time due to an outbreak so this dream of going to Texas just took a perform comedy is sort of taking a back seat and now you're hearing a lot of them say especially joe said the other day he's mainly going for taxes because i think they pay quite a lot of taxes in, the, in la or california um mostly i think it's like 30 percent or something crazy like that over a certain amount so even if you're earning 100 million on a spotify deal like joe is the last thing you want to be doing is giving away more than 30 percent of that to the tax man if you can avoid it especially ahead of the deal being signed and the money being transferred to his account it probably makes sense why he's moving so quickly um but it's a little clip from joe diaz kind of explaining the situation and what's going on and just maybe as a a bit of an indicator a bit of a caution not caution hotel maybe a bit of a heads up for just us regular folk in terms of maybe not just looking at the situation just kind of existing through it and just sort of sitting on our hands but looking at what's happening with covid around the world and wherever you are that's affecting you know how you are how it's which affected your plans right the fact you might have graduated or you have or the fact that you're going to start an internship or you were going to start a business or you're going to go on a holiday things you everyone's plans have been kind of you know thrown in their head so this might be a prime opportunity to actually assess reassess what you actually want to do and make some changes regardless because you know they're not going to all move there for comedy now because there's no comedy for a while maybe there's no stand-up at all there's no live entertainment in its conventional sense probably until the end of the year right so um they're just having to move anyway because they're seeing you know for the most part the residual or the after effects of this co of covid especially in a place like la or especially anywhere really for the after effects are going to be felt for a long time after the fact anyway so this is probably the best opportunity for you if you wanted to actually make some sort of radical life change to really think about it and you know and come to a decision quickly as possible because you don't want to waste this opportunity just kind of sit on your hands but this this is the video from joey diaz explaining why he's decided to or kind of announcing that he's basically leaving 
Let it load, let it load, let it load. If someone told me, hey, it's time to leave, yeah, I like that. But if I, if it's something that I have to make it my decision, I go back and forth. I'm not, I'm Listen, between off. you and I and the fourth wall, I knew it was time to leave in May. I knew it was time to leave. I had a funny feeling. I did not know about that they were going to reclose. I didn't know anything about that. But I thought it was time to leave in May. Oh, you mean L.A.? Yeah. In May, I was already telling people. I talked Rick Ramos into it. He got the fuck out of here. I talked my other friend to it. He got the fuck out of here. They, it made sense. They called me, and I told them, you got to go. I understand your pain. I understand what you're going through, and I wouldn't be here. Can you imagine how many people would have left if they knew it was going to last this long? Like, if, if in March you knew. When it came to that, he was really it's not working. Where was I? Why are they showing you on again? I don't know what's happening there. Can you still hear me? No, no, what's happening? Why are they saying that? Yeah, it's still on. I don't know why it sort of popped up again there, but um, sorry, Joe Diaz was on it. He was really, really on it. He knew exactly what he was talking about. He was kind of warning his fans, our listeners, such as myself, to kind of get you know to pull our heads out of our asses and really look at what's happening and make some changes. And it's hard, and even Lee mentioned previously at the beginning there, he said, you know, he's he'd most people are probably like that, right? You're only gonna make a move when somebody when there's no other option when you kinda of backed into a corner. But sometimes in life it doesn't you don't get messages or you don't get signs of what to do clearly like that. Sometimes they're coded or you have to kind of, you know, read between the lines or assess what's going on, right? I think he's Jerry mentioned a few times, you know, he's walks around his area and he counts the amount of moving vans he sees and that's a sort of indicator of whether or not he should leave, right? There's things that are happening around you that should give you an indication. And I think a lot of the people that I've known, especially people in my age group who have kind of gone away moved back home they've definitely reassessed that, especially the ones that were kind of high flying here in london because if you're able to kind of move back home and work from your laptop in your mom's room it doesn't matter right the fact that you can go back and have an, a roof uh, to stay under and you've got some wi-fi to use in terms of work that's definitely going to change the way that you um approach where you live and where you work especially if you think that most companies will maintain some level of remote working for uh, you know a prolonged period of time even once a vaccine is sorted because the last thing they want is to have a complete outbreak in their office have people off sick and you know all that kind of drama and negative press so a lot of those people who are staunchly oh, i'm gonna stay in london i'm gonna stay in manchester i'm gonna stay in liverpool these big cities they're probably looking at it thinking you know what if i could get away with working a few less hours in a week but then having to spend less money on rent and then having to spend less money on travel. So it all kind of offsets and balances itself off. And you've had a whole six month plus of living a quiet life where there's no clubs, there's no glitzy holidays. You've kind of come accustomed to, you know, um, living within your means. It's not really that much of a stretch, right? To then decide, you know what, actually, I'm not, once everything goes back to normal, I'm not going to re-enter re the rat race. I'm just going to find something that you know give brings me some level of fulfillment and then explore my hobbies on the side or explore my, my interests outside of work i think a lot of people are thinking that but this is the time to take that um that hint this is a time to take that um to make that leap you can't really wait for a sign to come along because if you're waiting for that you're gonna be waiting a hell of a long time and by the time you do make a move it's too late <clears throat> it was gonna last all year i bet 20 uh, 20 percent more people leave when I got the call from Rogan last week that he's leaving next month, that really just equated for me that that's it. It's time to look around and say, wow, I pay 13.8% in tax. Okay, the police is getting defunded. The prisoners are getting out and crime is on the rise. And I have a daughter in my house. And there's people walking around looking for a problem. Have you ever taken a ride at night lately? No. Take a ride at 11 o'clock at night. Go to Lancashire and make a left and go up towards Victory. Wait till you get to Victory. Wait till you see up there. Oh, and by Gold's Gym, it's, it's... And he's got a point there, and I think that's really accurate in terms of... 
it's less of a decision to go to Texas to go and do stand up because, you know, even though I'm sure most of it, there is part of them that's sort of hoping once Texas gets under control, they'll be probably more likely to reopen again, right? Their mayor and their governors seem to be a little bit more gung ho than the sort of cautious um, side of things in LA. So you'd assume once things do get under control there, they'll be quick. They'll probably reopen before LA does anyway or close about. So there's a benefit there. But just in terms of what's going on and the temperature that's going to exist in LA once everything settles down, because that's something people don't really understand too, right? All these places that again, absolutely blitz with protests and clashes with the police and all that sort of stuff when it does settles and people are still without jobs people are still suffering people are still going without what's going to happen then right what's the temperature going to be like in that city or in that town or in that district it's not going to be nice so the best thing you can do for you again if you've got the means to you should be looking to do something moving away from a big city maybe moving into a smaller city if you have been living in the country for a while i don't know this is the opportunity definitely to make some sort of change but i just thought it was interesting to see just in terms of the la comedy scene because we associate those guys so you know closely with la right they are essentially you know um, mainstays in the comedy store i'm sure most of them will probably be you know flying in and out from texas to la um someone like a joe could probably charter his own bloody private jet to go there that'd be funny you know if they kind of had their own little uh uh comedian private jet that they use imagine how there's already a divide right there's already a split between the new york comics and the east side east coast comics and the west side comics, west coast comics. imagine if they finally charter a private jet in the shape of a drake airlines and use that to sort of ferry them across back and forth from la to texas that would really cause a rift in the scene and it would be fucking insane but again i don't blame them man even myself i'm considering making the move you know like especially with covid happening like you just need to reassess everything you're doing it's such a again it's a terrible thing to happen to most people i think you know unless you're a multi-millionaire and you have the means or you've got a massive nest egg it's going to impact you it's going to hurt your pocket sooner rather than later whether it's from reduced hours being let go or whatever it may be it's going to affect you sooner rather than later so the best thing you can do especially if you have a, a young family especially if you're thinking of starting a family especially if you're at that age where you've you know deciding whether or not to what to do in your career long term this is a great opportunity to actually reassess and think hmm do i want to do x y and z is it the right time to do this thing is it the right time to go into this place is it the right time to even switch careers in the first place or should i be doubling down and you know trying everything and pouring into my dreams whatever it may be this is the time to really ask yourself that question and unlike other times where you kind of you know you sort of procrastinate this isn't the time once you make a decision you just got to act on it this is what again these guys are probably a bad example because they've all got money and they've all got means to do so but i think the fact that they're all leaving so quickly within the space of a month of each other right i've heard brendan Schaub and brian Keller mentioned they want to leave a few other people have said it like some people are moving to new york as well guys that were in la are moving back to new york because new york obviously has um got the virus under somewhat control there's a few clubs opening here and there with social distancing being enforced so they have a, a process of doing of kind of restarting their careers plus you could always come to europe um it's gonna be interesting to see what happens going forward in general what what, what the kind of landscape is in the in a, in a few months because if anybody thinks live shows are coming back they're not coming back for a while there's not gonna be any live shows for ages so live shows probably you know put down a back burner but if you are you know in the arts in the entertainment industry you definitely need to reassess things and try and make a some sort of adjustments whether that's working a crappy job just for the time being to keep the lights on or whether that's kind of moving somewhere else so you can get a crappy job wherever it may be try and do it as soon as possible do not waste any more of your precious time that's my advice anyway <clears throat> just move there okay i don't know why it keeps doing it sometimes sometimes it won't work sometimes it will work i'm not sure why that is Okay, there it's back now. Cool. So next on list, what do we have here? What do we have? Oh, Jeff, let's see. Yeah, same with Jeffrey Star. So So the Jeffrey Star apology. Yeah, I'll just uh, let me I'll have it playing in the background so you guys can see, but I'm sure you're from you're aware of what the situation is, right? Jeffrey Star, Shane Dawson, James Charles accusing him of being a sex pest or for, you know, trying to accost under no, he, the the accusation was that James Charles was allegedly um 
a monster, right? That he was trying to accost, you know, or get with people that weren't trying to get with him. I'm not just sure. Whatever it was. Anyway, it was a heinous accusation. They went back and forth. He accused him of some of a crime that he didn't want to report. Then he went around telling people he had a voice note uh, that proved that, that crime actually happened. Then he somehow manipulated a 40 year old woman. What's up, everybody? Then he somehow manipulated a 40 year old woman in Tati to then go and make a video that said by sisters that essentially kind of divulged the fact that she felt James Charles was acting up and changing and becoming too successful and forgetting who his friends were. And she was crying about that, you know, hair thing, and hair vitamins and all sorts of nonsense. And essentially the fallout was that James Charles kind of got semi cancelled. His young career essentially was under, was in jeopardy. Um, he lost a bunch of subscribers, you know, people dropped off the face of the earth for him. People were unfollowing him. Do you remember the unfollowing of James Charles? Everyone was unfollowing him on social, but then privately messaging him, right? The whole LA sort of entertainment entertainment snaky sort of stuff people do and then um somehow from it shane dawson and jeffrey star emerged like phoenixes right out from the flames then obviously it transpires that that whole story is kick and caboodle from the first for the you know from what we know so far that story seems to have a lot of holes in it jeffrey star probably lied he probably embellished a few things manipulated some people here and there allegedly so it seems like everyone got played and you know now we know that for the most part the issue i'll just have him playing in the background on mute why not because if i hear the actual video it's funny for the most part it seems as if jeffrey star was just uncomfortable with this young whippersnapping boy came coming up and sort of like taking his throne right in real great style because you know say what you want about james child's personality but you know the kid knows what he's doing when it comes to entertaining on the old youtube so um it then transpires that that whole thing is not true shane dawson gets into trouble for some previous you know indiscretions in the past um it also comes out that jeffrey star isn't the best of humans surprise surprise and for some reason which is annoying for me looking at it as a as a casual observer it seems like there's inability for people on youtube especially fans of youtubers or makeup youtubers or people that seem to be a little bit controversial there does seem to be a little bit of a unwillingness to accept people just the way they are jeffrey star keeps telling you as fans as casual viewers he keeps showing you who he is he keeps telling you that he's a you know he's a piece of shit basically shane dawson has you know for the most of his career i don't know how again he's another one which is interesting how he's attempt, managed to reinvent himself but he isn't the best of person either you know he doesn't seem to learn from his mistakes um he tends to have a very um uh, I've never really been a, a big fan of the whole pretending you you haven't don't have money thing. That's always been a bit of a grating thing. It's not bad that you do have money or successful. You've been on YouTube for more than a decade. People know you have money. There's no point of pretending you don't. Um, that was always rubbing up the wrong way in history. Onyx, I'm not really a big fan of, but he reinvented himself quite successfully, and people seem to be okay with it. So I guess for Shane Dawson, he's not really much to blame in this. The most kind of virtual people are directing to is Jeffrey Star because you know he was going through a, he went through a really tough period and Shane Dawson effectively rescued him with that documentary painted him in a whole different light people saw Jeffree Star as this you know amazing uh, businessman that was essentially you know spearheading an entire empire from the comfort of his like bedazzled mansion and you know it completely rewrote the narrative on jeffrey star so you would imagine if shane dawson's going through something jeffrey star will step in and say hey this is my friend i've got his back i don't agree with anything he did in the past but i'm going to be there for him no matter what nah he didn't do that though he went completely dark he he kind of re removed himself from the internet which he actually didn't do because we spotted in random videos and hanging out with you know such illustrious people like black china and he completely for the looks of it abandoned his friend and people were surprised by that but you shouldn't be. Jeffree Star's never been loyal to anyone by himself. He's always been looking, he, he's always looked after number one, which is probably the reason why he's he's sustained this long in the industry um, because he's capable of doing that. He's capable of, you know, opening his arms and welcoming people into his group or making a whole new clique of people that he supports, whether they're smaller YouTubers or YouTubers that are trying to approach his level. But when, at a moment's notice, when it feels, you know, when needs must and he wants to move on or he feels like you've outlived your use, he will drop you drop you like a sack of potatoes easily easy it doesn't really blink an eyelid so when people were surprised by it i was surprised that they were surprised he constantly told you that was who he was as a person and people 
constantly keep getting surprised. Then he breaks his silence, right? After, I don't know how many weeks of saying nothing. And this is why he breaks his silence with the video I've got here playing in the background. He's sitting on a gold, is it like a gold crushed velvet couch? Um, essentially talking about the issue, saying what he'd done. No, not really talking about the issue. Essentially skirting all over it and using it as an as a time to not only apologize but not apologize, and then also invoke the spirit of Black Lives Matter, um, and then also um, tease a new launch that he has coming up. And I don't know, man. Like looking at it again from the outside in, I just I'm just surprised. I pause it now because it doesn't matter. I'm just surprised that people are surprised that Jeffrey is stars like this and they get annoyed by it. That's what really catches, that's what really causes me off guard. What did you expect him to do? He's always shown you he's this person and he's going to continue doing so. So it's going to be interesting to see how he sort of carries on from this. If you're judging by his Twitter profile, he doesn't seem to give a crap. He's uploaded loads of pictures of himself dressed up in you know varying levels of garbs, um, essentially telling us, hey, I don't care about what's going on. I'm moving on. This is my life and I like it. And, you know, what can you do? You know, you can't really cancel somebody like that. You know, somebody as rich as he is with the amount of fans that he has. I'm sure there's a whole segment of his customer base that has no idea about the YouTube drama. They don't care. Um, they could care less if you even told them about it. It wouldn't impact their buying decisions. So if anything, he probably would be best served just focusing on, you know, these paying customers and anybody else that just is, is kind of a fan of Jeffree Star, the personality he can sort of like, you know, do one in that effect. But the fact that people are disappointed i'm surprised i don't think you should be disappointed i think that you should be at a stage now especially youtube is, is is at a mature enough stage now where you should be you should be in you should be adult enough to make a decision not adult enough you should be in a position where you can make a rational decision as to who you want to follow and kind of ride by based on the information you have to hand but you can't be hoping per some person uh certain personality changes into the person you want them to be so you can be a fan again you just have to accept them for what they are in that moment and if you do you have to just ride or die with them that's it you can't expect them to change um it doesn't make any sense um really because they go consistently disappoint you consistently let you down they can consistently tell you and remind you who exactly they are and you're consistently being surprised which i just don't think is worth anyone's time really in that respect but Bloody hell, man. What an absolute legend. Really. You've gone silent. You've ignored everybody. Your your friend is getting dragged on social. He's getting absolutely destroyed. He's having, you know, Tati make another video about him. He's crying on live and his, being hysterical and calling people liars over IG live. And just, you know, his whole world is, it's not really crumbling, but you know how dramatic these people are, right? So I say it's quote unquote crumbling around him. And where's Jeffrey? Where is he? Nowhere to be found. Just, you know, enjoying life, uh, swimming in his swimming pool buying new dogs like just <laughs> or buying new cars actually sorry didn't buy new dogs bought new he bought a new car like absolute piss take in it like friendships honestly LA is the worst man friendships that's why it's probably best if you do move there as a smaller YouTuber maybe go with a couple of your friends back home who and just get them to help you out with you know setting up lightings and turning off and on your recorder I don't know just get them to live with you for a bit because if something does go wrong and you end up in a bit of a scandal, you end up having a bit of a falling out with somebody, oof, it will get really lonely really quickly over there. Really lonely really quickly. But hey, what do I know? Anyway, that's the News Digger Show, episode number 345. Thanks so much for tuning in. If this is your first time listening and you liked what you heard, of course, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you're watching or listening, actually, via the podcast app, make sure you leave me a five-star review and share it with your friends. And if you want to continue supporting the show and you want to get early access to full podcast episodes, please join my Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash Agostino. That's patreon.com forward slash Agostino, spell A G O S T I N H O, all one word. You'll find a link below in the show notes descriptions. Until then, be safe, enjoy your weekend, and I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace. <laughs>